Let's uh, take another look at water in the hydrologic cycle because water, as we've said before, has a huge heat capacity and so it transfers a lot of energy around the planet, uh, especially when the water changes phases from solid water or ice into liquid water and from liquid water into vapor. Uh, let's have a little look again at the hydrologic cycle and see how that works. Uh, basically what goes on here is water on the surface of the oceans evaporates up into the atmosphere condenses and forms clouds. The condensation then falls back down in some form of precipitation or runoff. It collects in rivers and lakes, etc. Some of it finds its way into the ground through what is called percolation, and this becomes the groundwater, but eventually all water will find its way downhill back into the ocean again. So we know that water is constantly being cycled and moved around the planet, and this hydrologic cycle does two things. And not only does it move the water around the planet and distribute it, but it also cleans it. The process of evaporation uh, cleans the water and purifies it. So we're going to have a look uh, in this lesson at the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. And and when we talk about heat effusion, we mean that the heat effusion of a substance is the amount of energy that is absorbed when one mole of the substance changes from a solid phase into a liquid phase without a change in temperature. Now, this is really important. No change in temperature. We're just changing the particles from being solid, like ice, for example, into being liquid water. And that conversion is just simply a phase change. There's no change in temperature, just a rearrangement of the particles. Heat of vaporization is kind of the same sort of thing, only we're talking at the higher end of the temperature scale here. This is where we have a substance, the amount of energy absorbed when one mole of the substance changes from liquid to vapor, and again, without a change in temperature. So if, for example, you have a look at the, uh, the temperature changes in water as we add heat, you'll see we get these two flat zones here. So right here in this section, this is solid ice being warmed up. And then this flat zone is, in the case of water, this is exactly zero degrees Celsius. And during this flattened out phase, the heat that's being added to the substance doesn't raise its temperature at all. What it does simply is rearrange the particles from solid ice into liquid water, and that requires energy. We then have a liquid phase right here where the water is heated up until it reaches its boiling point. And so for water, that would be 100 degrees Celsius. And again, we have this flat zone. So what's going on here is the liquid particles are being rearranged into a vapor state. And at that time, there'll be no change. If you have a thermometer stuck inside the pot of water, you'll see the, the thermometer stays the same. But if you could measure the vapor, when it converts into vapor, you would see the temperature of that one increase. Uh, over here on this little chart, we have a little reminder of what these changes of state are called. Uh, so, for example, when liquid water becomes ice, we call that freezing. The reverse process is called melting, when ice becomes water. When water turns into uh, water vapor, uh, we call that process uh, evaporation. And when water vapor goes back into being water, we call that condensation. And then, of course, we do have another one, which is when a solid becomes a water vapor. We call that sublimation. And so this is a case where, say, a frost on a windshield uh, turns into vapor without melting. The temperature is still below zero, for example. The opposite is called condensation. Some textbooks call that uh, sublimation as well. So we call this the latent heat, again, of fusion. And by that, we mean basically the delayed heat the heat that is used to rearrange the uh, the particles from a solid to a liquid. Now, this can have some interesting effects, for example. Um, back in the old days, when uh, Granny used to keep her vegetables down in a root cellar, like you see here, uh, there was the problem of how do I prevent my uh, my vegetables from freezing on a really cold winter night? And the answer was pretty simple. Uh, Granny would put a bucket of water uh, in her root cellar, and what would happen is, uh, during the night, the heat from the water, of course, would leave and fill up the airspace inside the root cellar. There's a lot of heat inside that bucket of water. Of course, as the heat leaves, that water would then freeze into solid ice. So when Granny comes into the root cellar in the morning, she would find the ice uh, in the bucket had probably frozen now, but her vegetables would be saved because the heat from the water would have gone into the root cellar. 
farmers in Florida do this same trick uh, with their orange crops. Uh, when they have a really uh, cold night and they're worried about their oranges freezing, which would totally ruin them, what they do is they turn on their sprinkling system and cover the oranges with water. What will happen during the night then is if the water does freeze, which it very well might do, in order to freeze, of course, the water has to give away its heat. And we hope that it'll give its heat to the fruit of the orange and thereby save the orange. So that in the morning, you'll find that the water has frozen, but the oranges have absorbed that heat and, and they survived the night. And of course, as you might guess, we have a formula for calculating the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. And here it is. Uh, it's simply stated like this. It's a pretty simple little equation. The heat of fusion is equal to Q divided by N, where Q is the quantity of thermal energy that we measure in kilojoules, thousands of joules, and N is the amount of the substance measured in moles. So you've got to remember a little bit of your chemistry, how to calculate moles. Well, the number of moles is the mass of the substance divided by its molar mass that you look up on the periodic table. Well, I guess the best way to understand this is to try a few. So when uh, 0.751 kilojoules of thermal energy is added to 0.125 moles of ice, at 0 degrees Celsius, the ice changes phase. It uh, becomes liquid. Calculate the experimental heat of fusion of ice. So we'd use our formula that says the heat of fusion is equal to Q divided by the number of moles. Well, we have all the information we need here because uh, they've already told us, for example, that the, num the amount of heat here, the Q is 0 0.751 kilojoules, and the number of moles is 0 0.125 moles. So we didn't have to do any other work. All we really have to do is bring up the calculator and turn it on, and we'll take uh, 0 0.751 and we will divide it by 0 0.125 and we get our answer so this works out to be uh, 6.008 um, kilojoules per mole and since we really can only have three significant digits I guess we better take this guy and round it off to 6.01 kilojoules per mole and have our significant digits how much thermal energy is required to completely melt uh, 3.2 moles of ice at zero degrees Celsius. Well, the basic equation was the heat of fusion is equal to Q divided by N. Only this time, we're trying to figure out how to calculate Q. So I'm going to switch colors here and say, look, what if I gave you a, a, a question like this? Well, what if I told you that uh, 3 is equal to 15 divided by 5? And I said to you, I want to get this top number, like that Q there. I want to get that top number, the 15. Well, you'd say, well, multiply. You'd say multiply the 3 times the 5, and you'd get it. And I'd say, okay, if that's the case then, then you can get Q by simply taking the heat of fusion and multiplying it by the number of moles. So in our case, the heat of fusion um, that we have for ice, if we look that one up, it's uh, 6.0 kilojoules per mole. And if we have the number of moles, which we do, multiply that by 3.20 moles, what do we get? Well, once again, we bring up the calculator here, and we say, how much is 6.0 multiplied by 3.2? What do we get? We get 19.2. So our answer comes out to be 19.2. Now, 19.2 what? Well, these moles are in the denominator. These are in the numerator. They cancel out. Your answer is kilojoules, which makes perfect sense because Q, the amount of heat, is measured in kilojoules. How about this one? Calculate the amount of moles of ice that, at 0 degrees Celsius that can be melted by the addition of 15.0 kilojoules of thermal energy. Well, again, the basic equation is the heat of fusion is equal to the amount of heat, the quantity of heat, divided by the number of moles. Well, this time we're trying to solve it for the number of moles. So, again, if I gave you a simple equation like I did before, if I said to you that 3 is equal to 15 divided by 5, only this time we're seeking this number, the number of moles, which over here means this bottom number, this 5. What would you do with what you got left over? Well, you'd probably say, I can get the 5 by taking 15 divided by 3. That'll, that'll get me my 5 here. All right, well, apply the exact same technique to getting your n. So the number of moles what you could get by taking q, the top number, and dividing it by the heat of fusion. All right, so let's uh, let's put in our values for that one. Uh, the, the amount of heat was 15 decimal zero 
kilojoules of heat energy and the uh, theoretical heat of fusion of ice was 6.00 uh, kilojoules per mole and I guess it's time to get out the calculator here to find that answer so we're going to take 15 uh, 0.0 and divide that by 6.00 and we get for an answer 2.5 2.5 2.5 what well the kilojoules cancel each other out you've got yourself 2.5 uh, moles of ice determine the experimental heat diffusion of copper given that it takes 0 0.606 kilojoules of thermal energy to melt 100 grams of solid copper at its melting point and they also tell us that the molar mass of copper is 63.55 grams per mole. All right, so the equation starts off by saying, all right, the heat of fusion, we're back to this again, is Q divided by the number of moles. And that's fine. They tell us Q. They tell us that we have that many kilojoules, but they don't tell us the number of moles we have. Uh, they tell us uh, what the molar mass of copper is, and they tell us we have 100 grams of it, but that doesn't tell us how many moles. To get the number of moles, number of moles is the mass divided by the molar mass. So to get my moles, I would have to take, over here, I would take the mass of 100 grams, and I would divide that by the molar mass of copper from the periodic table, which is 63.55 grams per mole, and see what that works out on the calculator. So if I take 100 and divide it by 63.55. Uh, I get quite the answer here. I get 1.57356, yada, yada, yada. And the grams cancel out. So this is moles. So that's how many moles I've got. Well, now I can go back to my original equation up here. And if I want to calculate uh, the heat of fusion, I'd say, all right, uh, that'll be take the quantity of heat, which was 0. Point, uh, what did it say, 606 kilojoules, and now divide that by the number of moles that we just figured out, which was 1.573564, yada, 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 moles. Okay, so it's, it's calculator time. What do we get if we have 0. 0.606, and we divide that by 1 decimal five seven three eight six four and it's important when you're in these middle stages not to round off just yet get your answer first we'll round off at the end so we get an answer i'll put it over here we get an answer of 0 0.385039 yada 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 kilojoules squeeze it in here per mole all right, well, we can really only have three significant digits in our answer, so we're going to have to call it 0 0.385, and the next digit is 0, so I'll leave it at that 5 kilojoules per mole. There's our answer for that one. Now, the same thing holds true with calculating the heat of vaporization. It's just like the heat of fusion. The heat of vaporization is the quantity of heat divided by the number of moles, so that is very, very similar. Uh, so we have when 8.70 kilojoules of thermal energy is added to 2.50 moles of liquid methanol, all the methanol enters the vapor phase. Determine the experimental heat of vaporization of methanol. So the heat, uh, again, of vaporization, so it's exactly the same as fusion, is quantity of heat divided by number of moles. The quantity of heat was 8.70 kilojoules. The number of moles was 2.50 moles so that's pretty straightforward they've given us all the information we need we just need to divide it out eight decimal seven zero divided by two decimal five zero we get an answer of three point four eight kilojoules per mole for methanol Next question, when 250 grams of uh, liquid water evaporates, 564.0 kilojoules of thermal energy is absorbed. Determine the experimental heat of vaporization of water, given that water has a molar mass of 18.02 grams per mole. All right, well, again, the, the basic equation says the, the heat of vaporization is equal to the quantity of heat divided by the number of moles. Uh, but we have a problem here. We need to figure out first how many moles of water we got here. 
Well, so we'll stop a little bit and say number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. The mass of water we were given was 250 grams. The molar mass of water, they gave that to us so we didn't have to look it up, but it's 18.02 grams per mole. So if we want to find the molar mass, we're going to have to do a little bit of division here. So we've got 250 divided by 18.02 looks like we've got ourselves 13 decimal and here we go 8734737 yada 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 grams cancel out this is moles now again don't round off we don't round off until we get to the end so now we want to calculate the heat of vaporization well they told us the amount of heat they said it was uh, 564 decimal zero kilojoules and now i know the number of moles was 13.8734 yada 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 moles I'll put the answer over here so now we can perform our last division how much is 564.0 and then divide that by the uh, number of moles which was 13 decimal 8 oh hang on I forgot my decimal point here decimal um, 873 Four. That should be enough to get the job done, I'm pretty sure. And what do we get out of the deal? We get an answer of 40.6531, yada, 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 kilojoules per mole. Now, I can only really have three significant digits in my answer because I've only got three significant digits in my original numbers. So I'm going to have to round this thing off to 40. There's two decimal what shall the next number be? Well, I've got a 5 after that 6, so I guess that'll make the 6 into a 7. And there's my final answer. Lastly, calculate the amount of thermal energy that's required to change 500 grams of water from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. The molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole, and the theoretical heat of vaporization of water is 40.65 kilojoules per mole. So they want us to calculate the Q. So the original equation is the heat of vaporization is Q divided by N, and they're saying we want you to calculate this, calculate the Q. All right, well, if I use a simple equation, if I use 3 is equal to 15 divided by 5, and I said I want to get this top number, what would I do? And you'd say, well, you'd multiply 3 times 5. All right, well, if we apply the same strategy here, we could say you can get the Q by taking your heat of vaporization and simply multiplying it by the number of moles. Well, the heat of vaporization is, uh, what is it, 40.65 kilojoules per mole. And the number of moles is, aha, now, we don't know the number of moles, do we? We've got to back up a little bit and use the equation. The number of moles is the mass divided by the molar mass. The mass of water they gave us, they gave us 500 grams of water. The molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole. So that's the mass of two hydrogens plus one oxygen. We divide that out and we'll have the uh, number of moles of water. So if we take 500 and divide it by 18.02, we get, we get 27.7469, yada, 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 grams cancel out, moles. All right, so now we can go back to our calculation and say uh, that's 40.65 kilojoules per mole multiplied by 27.7469, moles. The moles are going to cancel out. So our answer is going to be measured in kilojoules, which is exactly what we wanted. We were trying to calculate the quantity of heat here. So what do we get? Now I'm going to leave my answer that was already in there. I've got my 27 decimal 7, etc. moles. I just got to multiply the answer that's in my calculator by 40.65 and get my answer. All right, I get 1,127.91343 kilojoules. Now, again, I can only have three significant digits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to scientific notation, and I'm going to just get these first three digits. It'll be 1.1, and the third digit, because there's a 7 after that 2, the third digit will have to be a 3, and I'll multiply that by 10 to the third power. Because once we go over 1,000, we kind of prefer using scientific notation, 
and that of course would be kilojoules. So there's examples of how you do these calculations. They're not really that hard. We're going to try your hand at these in class.